Oh yeah, my name is Garrett Ida. <coughs> this is William Lamb. Uh, it's good to be here today. And uh, anyway, that was, a, that was indeed a great intro. We have, uh, to get started, we actually shot a commercial about maybe six or so months ago. And uh, it really showcases the fun, the motivation, the aspiration of the Dark Energy brand. And since that time, it's matured and grown to probably a later stage in its brand development. But, uh, but for the fir one of our first videos to launch and kickstart uh, Dark Energy, this was a really fun project. And so we'd like to show that to you right now. We're going to go ahead and turn off the lights. Leave the windows. Oh, here we go. So we're all too familiar with this right here. How many of you have not experienced this? Nobody, right? Nobody put your hand up. <laughs> so um, frankly, this is something that me and Garrett experience all the time as well. And whether it's on your way to, you know, to school, to work, to, um, or hanging out with friends, you're exchanging contacts with a girl or a guy, or you know, you're traveling again, or like my partner who likes to stay alive when he's up in the air. He needs to know, you know, altitude and all that. Or when you're hiking. Everything you do in life now in this era pretty much required connectivity. <laughs> Especially our generation. We are all connected. And when disasters happen, like the one back in, I mean, a year or so ago in New York, Hurricane Sandy, I mean, look at what's happening here. Everyone's trying to stay charged. Take a second and read this. <laughs> and I mean, although this is an over-dramatized version of real life, but how many of us really don't communicate by outside of the means of you know, having your smartphone, having your tablet, and that's the way we communicate. And battery performance is one of the things that is affected by our constant connectivity. And when we think about, I mean, how unsatisfying that is, <coughs> actually, there's a research done that battery capacity increases only 5% every year. And mobile device performance improves 300 to 3,000% every year. So battery capacity and performance is not keeping up. Now we have about 2 billion of these devices connected to the internet. And in 2020, we're going to find 15 billion and more devices connected. <coughs> Think of how many people are going to be connected and constantly needing more power, right? Yeah. And, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Can I use that quicker? Yeah. Go for it. And so with so many mobile devices that need, that need power, obviously there are going to be some competitors out there. And a few that you see up here are the one made by Eaton, Mophie, and, oh wow, and iMobile. You'll notice that each one of these, they look like a big brick. And that's what it feels like when you carry these around. That was something that we noticed had to be changed. And if we take a closer look at some of the leading competitors, this is, this is Mophie. This is the, 
the big dog in the power, portable power industry right now. They generated $300 million last year That's off right. just selling battery, so. Exactly, and so, um, <clears throat> so our competitor product right here, it's thick, it's heavy, and it gives you about two to three charges for your standard smartphone. Uh, Mo, uh, not Mo, excuse me, uh, MyCharge also makes another portable charger. Similarly, it's unfortunately ugly and bulky and only two to three charges. Even Energizer, the big power juggernaut that Energizer is, makes a device, it's weak, it's still, it's still quite large, it's expensive, and it only gives you one to two charges. It leaves us thinking, oh, I can't leave this. My portable charger sucks. And, <laughs> And that's why we created the reservoir. It's slim, sleek, extremely powerful. So powerful that with actually, I'm, I'm powering my phone right now. So this is the reservoir. This is the white version of the reservoir. This little device right here will charge your standard iPhone 5 five times. And my phone, my phone it charges maybe about four times. It's got a little bit larger battery. But this is the, this is the flagship product of dark energy, and we love it. That was, that's what uh, Dr. Little was talking about when he opened for us. I love it, Garrett. Hey, thanks. So as Garrett said, this pretty much gives you, I mean, five charges, most people don't really drain their battery completely. So when you go camping, this is way too echoey. Can't do it. One sec. Better. OK. When you go camping, when you go on travel, when you do other things that may take you away, away for a week, out, I mean, you're not going to be near the outlet for a week, then you can use our device. <laughs> Frankly, we've gotten, I mean, right now we're giving you the kind of like the standard presentation, kind of showing you what the product is, what the pro company does. But I kind of want to give you a little bit of a quick insider slash update on their company. So recently, we've been um, getting a lot of inquiries from large corporations to buy this for their executives. So <clears throat> I'm not going to name the name specifically, but one of the following companies, because I can't tell you exactly which one, but it's it, it could be Google, it could be Apple, it could be Microsoft. But one of the three is, <laughs> is wanting to buy about 10,000 of them because they're like, well, there will be executives from other companies that visit our campus, our corporate campus, and we need to give them gifts. And we've looked at many chargers, but none, none of them occupy as little space as yours. In fact, ours is the most compact in the world and still look good and gives you that much power. This is a perfect marriage between engineering and design. So they wanted to order you know, a large quantity. And they're one example. And there are many other um, smaller and medium-sized companies that are either interested in purchasing from us to give as gifts or for their own employees or to sell for us. So um, you want to give this? OK, we'll just run through this quickly. I mean, as you can see, this is uh, for marketing, so. But it's true, so. <laughs> now, look at this. <laughs> so actually, um, the next slide is we're going to kind of introduce you into a Nick's. Um, I'm going to stand over here so I can see my partner. Um, so next slide, we're going to start talking about our brand. Because we all know that products don't just win by itself. We all know that when you sell a product, you can't just compete on features. Because everyone could say, my product, you know, <laughs> they could improve their product the next year and say, hey, my product beats you by this much. Compare specs to specs. And you're just going to be on a constant war of features and specs. And we don't want to do that. Although we know that to win, we have to have a premium product. However, not only do we have the best product, we want to have the best brand. And since the beginning, we've been developing this brand, that this lifestyle, this motivational-based lifestyle that Garrett's going to tell you a little bit more about. That's right. Oh, I'm going to trap by this. Um, 
So when we thought about the dark energy lifestyle, we wanted to create something that was it was fun, it was energetic, it was it made you want to kind of get up in the morning and go out and go do something, and and that's something that's been lacking in the portable power marketplace right now, because all of the competitors they all want to keep trying to do what everyone else is doing. They're all trying to copy Mophie. And so as a result, you get all these clones of Mophie who don't do anything that Mophie does well. And so how is dark energy going to differentiate? How is dark energy going to be better than the biggest, the biggest competitor in the industry who has more money and more resources and except, yeah, more of everything almost? Well, it's going to be, it's going to come through a competitive edge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we, go, we talk about the story and after this presentation. And, uh, but I want to say that, that the dark energy lifestyle, it's got, it's, it embodies freedom and power of not only that you carry power with you, but power of the individual and also independence. It's something that it, it can be, like dark energy devices, They'll cater to a wide variety of people, whether you're a business professional and a, a your regular daily user, or an outdoor enthusiast and traveler. Our our target market group is between the ages of around 20 to 30 year old professionals and outdoor enthusiasts. And as you can see, the reservoir itself it it works with a host of devices, literally any USB device. So um, my partner is looking at me, so I guess I'm going to be talking about this. <laughs> so actually, this, this slide, I'm definitely prepared to talk about it. Because we also, not only are these ones, are, all right, not only did these press feature us, we have had a lot more. This is back in August. And I, I handle, well, I handle also the PR in our company. And we have had um, this, well, I shouldn't tell you all the details either. but. There's this company that is associated <laughs> largely with all of the Apple-related blocks. They, are, um, they range from 60 million monthly users to um, 300,000. And there's about 28 of them. And they're all um, about to launch a campaign for us next month, the beginning of next month. So you're going to find us on a bunch of Apple Mac-related websites. And these are, I mean, Mashable is definitely a big one. They have about 6 million following. But when you go to something that has like a 60 million following, that's quite a different site. I mean, the influence can help your revenue tremendously. Um, these are some of the ones that also interviewed us. And Uncrate is, um, Uncrate is actually a really cool site. I don't know if you guys have uh, had a chance to check it out. It's got about. I mean, it's only got a million following every month, but <coughs> but they they target a hundred. Well, they target these people that have an income of 150k um, yearly income, annual income of 150k plus. So they can, and all of the stuff they have on their site are premium products, and you're gonna find the most, some of the most outrageous, random, cool things, and and people buy them there. So, um, not saying that ours is. Outrageous. Ours is awesome. <laughs> Outrageously awesome. Um, so the presentation is rather short. We've cut out a lot of stuff um, because it was mostly prepared for kind of the investors and, and like the general public. But we want to give you guys the run through of how we started, the story of dark energy, how we you know developed the product, and why we're so passionate about this, and how we have gone through. You know, honestly, being an entrepreneur, you will experience some of the most depressing days of your life. And the same day, you'll have some of the most joyous days. Like, it's, it's hard to explain. But we'll go through all these moments and kind of run through the story. So. Oh, yeah. Um, we're going to just keep this up while we talk. But, uh, but feel free to visit us at darkenergytech.com. And uh, maybe it's mostly because we hope that you'd go on there and buy some products. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, darkenergytech.com, uh, and also, uh, yeah, actually, we'll we'll throw our emails up at the end. But um, 
I wanted to get started with uh, a little bit about, about how, literally the very beginning, how did we come together, how did we get started? Uh, so my background is in mechanical engineering. I kind of started with the medical route and then decided it wasn't for me and ditched that and mechanical engineering. Uh, I actually have not graduated. I'm still in school right now. Um, I am in an unusual case because I have, so this semester I dropped all my classes except for one and I'm taking ice skating. He's and pretty much a dropout. So. I love it. So, so yeah, I'm as close to dropout as you can get without actually being a dropout. That's how you do it, guys. Right. And so I have yeah, four classes left. Uh, and so the reason why I dropped all my classes is because there, you'll reach a point where you'll understand that your opportunities are so massive that if you don't take advantage of them, you're a fool. And they say, fool, don't be a fool, stay in school. That's nonsense, okay? <laughs> That's complete nonsense, all right? Don't think about school, think about education, all right? And uh, I hope that my educator, like the pe uh, educators in the room aren't gonna kill me for this, but, uh, but I want to tell a quick story about, about climbing a mountain. <clears throat> now, when you came to school, you thought, <clears throat> it's like, oh, you thought of it like a mountain. You know, I wanna I want climb the mountain, right? And, and so you associated that, you know, your schooling you know, getting a, a diploma, for instance, was like reaching the summit of this mountain. But along the way, you know, you started climbing and you saw, oh, wow, there's, here's a, there's like, you see a peak. And you're like, oh, that must be the summit. And so you start climbing, 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 climbing. And then, and it's kind of like, kind of like schooling. And so your education was the actual summit. However, along the way, you found that these, a peak that you found while climbing the mountain, and you, once you scaled it, you realized it was actually a false peak. You hadn't actually scaled the mountain yet. And what I'm trying to say is that I want you to keep in mind what your lifelong goals are. If you're looking for an education, if you're looking for to change the world, or you're looking to, I don't know, you pick, pick a goal that you believe in and set your sights on it, and don't, don't associate anything else with that goal other than the goal itself. That's kind of confusing. But the point is that, you know, if you want to start a company and you want to raise it to, you know, X million dollars or you want to have a, a nonprofit and help X amount of people in Africa or here in your own very neighborhoods, keep that in mind and don't let anything stop you because a lot of things get in our way and we often view them as these false peaks along the way and we have to reevaluate our lives. And so keep that in mind. Just to add on to what Garrett's been saying, that, that was a great analogy. He hasn't shared that with me before, so I was, I was pretty touch over here, too. Um, so a, a kind of a good example of what's happened to us. Two years ago, actually February, um, yeah, two years ago, exactly, we were sitting in my super ghetto apartment and um, my couch was way ghetto too, and he hates it. Um, we were talking about, he really does, he complains every time he comes by. <laughs> um, but we were having a brainstorming session, and then we were talking about like our, our dreams and visions in our life, and we kind of wanted to start a company. And then we were reading the book called Think and Grow Rich at that time. And in the book, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book, it's funded by Andrew Carnegie, the first billionaire in history. So it's a good book. Um, we were th talking about the principles in the book, how you have to write down the goals that you have, regardless of how unrealistic or whatever, and set a timeline. So we were sitting there, and we were like, ah, this, this is a good monetary number to set um, for our company in two years. And then we went back and forth. We disagreed. We agreed. We disagreed. And we're like, oh, that's too high. That's too low. That's not good enough. That's not stretching enough. That's too unrealistic. And then we came to a really, we came to a good agreement. And then we're like, wow, that's still really uncomfortable. We, we don't, we have no idea what we're doing, but we should, we should do this. And we wrote down this number on paper. We signed. And um, I mean, honestly, we didn't like follow the exact principle 
and read it like every morning. Um, and before we went to bed, we didn't do that. We just thought about it, you know, over and over. We and it's constantly on our mind. Now it's been two years, and we we had conversations with investors all the time, and we actually were evaluated at double the amount of the monetary goal that we set two years ago for this month. So just know that if you are willing to go for it, if you're willing to set goals and if you're willing to head for the peak, you can make it. So absolutely. Yeah. Should we talk a little bit about how we kind of met and like got started on the business? Yeah. Definitely. So when, when we met, he thought I was crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> That summer, I actually just got back from UN, and I really just met a guy when I, OK, long story short, I was, in, I was praying about my life after my mission. I was like, what should I do? What should I study? And I've always wanted to get into aerospace. Got this feeling I should go to Austria. And this is the most random feeling ever. And I was like, OK, I'm going to do it. So um, I bought my ticket, you know, signed up on this study abroad, and I was like, this is kind of crazy. I don't know what I'm doing. It could be a waste of money. Anyway, I got there. I got this feeling I should do missionary work. Um, and I started like making a bunch of non-member friends. And one time, we got invited to this birthday party. And um, one of the people there was not a member. And I was like, perfect. This is my opportunity. And, um, and we were just you know, casually talking. And we started bonding. And he was like, hey, man, what do you really want to do in your life? And I was like, well, I, I'm really into um, aerospace technology, and I love it. <coughs> Excuse me. Got excited. <coughs> I, I, no. I, uh, I'm really, um, I, I want to get into aerospace and one day start my own private aerospace company. And he's like, oh, no way. I go to a UN space conference every year. Would you like to come? I was like, well, if you insist. I mean, I'm kind of busy, but. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, like, I, I obviously accepted the, the uh, invitation. I thought he was joking. But two days later, he actually legitimately sent me an email invite that I went and got an interview and got clearance, and then I got my pass. And then there I was in the UN Space Conference hanging out with these astronauts. That, there were some of the first astronauts that went to space. And anyway, I told Garrett this story when I first met him, and he thought I was absolutely insane and out of my mind. He didn't really believe me. And anyway, and... Um, it was pretty funny. That's how we met. And uh, I remember telling him, I, I feel like this was a sign that I can, we can really, I can really, we should explore on our potential. And, um, and we got talking about how he actually, I want, actually, I want you to talk about your passion in space as well. Is that, it is that, works? Can you hear yeah. that? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so just really short, um, I really want to get to the, like the story of, and some of the some of the obstacles we've overcome since uh, we started Dark Energy, but uh, yeah. So honestly, the thing that brought William and I together is uh, space. We both love aerospace. We love. Uh, we're kind of nerdy, you know what I mean? Uh, so William's background is uh, information technology. You know, I was an engineer, and we <laughs> bonded over like you know doing things in space and. Like, you know, I love jets, and that's how I had the experience with Lockheed. And so, um, <clears throat> honestly, uh, uh, some people try to figure out how to get a team together. They don't really know how to build a team. And, uh, and in our case, I literally, when we met, I mean, it, Will's right. I thought he was completely crazy when I first <laughs> met him. Um, he's completely different from the man who stands in front of you right now, in my own defense. But... Uh, he, I mean, we got together and we decided, you know what, we, we have a common goal, ultimately. And in order to get there, we, we know that well, we like each other, we work well with each other, and our, our abilities, I mean, my hardware ability, his software ability, uh, those meld well together, they're complementary. And also, I mean, so, something about about Will is he's the most loyal person I've ever met. Ever met. Including everyone I've ever met. The most loyal. Thanks. And, and I, I'm serious. I have, but, uh, and, and that's something that's so key when you find a partner or partners to start with. And so 
we got together and then we found an idea. You don't have to do it this way, but that's what worked for us. And so a lot of people will, will find an idea, they'll think, you know, this is exactly what we want to do, they'll do market research on their own, and then they'll go and further build out their team, which is another great way to do it. But I just want you to understand that as you're building your teams and, and thinking about that for the future, that there are multiple ways to do it. So don't feel like you're pigeonholed and do it one way or the other. Um, but, uh, one thing I want to add to that is um, <laughs> I remember Garrett wasn't really, um, well, he was excited about you know, the future of space and that the potential of you know, working together. But he wasn't like at first all, I mean, both of us really weren't that committed at the beginning. We were just talking, right? I mean, that's how usually you start. And, um, but I remember we had this conversation that Garrett was like, well, with all these people out there, of all the competition in the world, what makes you think that you can succeed? What makes you think that you can you know, change the world or whatever? And I remember a quote from Steve Jobs. He said, it's the crazy people that are crazy enough to believe that you can change the world, end up changing the world. Because it will come a time when your, your friends, your family, your boss, your teacher, um, your girlfriend, your wife, everyone tells you that you can't do it. But you still believe in yourself. And you, there's still a part of you that's like, I am going to make this happen. And that's, that's the spirit. That's the entrepreneurial spirit. And we found that in each other. And, and when we got together, we started talking about ideas. We ran through a bunch of them. We even thought about 3D printing before it was like crazy popular like right now. But it was expensive to get into, required a ton of technical background, and we were both sophomores. And I mean, really, come on. So, um, so we didn't get into that. And uh, there's a lot of other things that we thought through. We thought about motorized bicycle, which also was another, actually, um, there's a Kickstarter project from Sweden that did that, that raised like $600,000 or so in a month. That's also another idea that we had. Um, but we didn't go for it because we know that to scale, we wanted to scale. We wanted to scale to an idea that's worth billions. We wanted to scale to a point that is not only <coughs> something that would be nice to have, but is a necessity. And on top of that, it will allow you to do, mo do more with your life. So that's when we came up with the idea of a portable charging system. Um, there are some great questions that were sent to us that I'd like to answer. Um, and also, guys, I want this to be like relatively casual. If you have a question about something that we've said, just ask, okay? Uh, we have like, you know, 15 or 12 minutes or something like that left. Um, so seriously, um, if you have questions about it, just throw them up. Uh, this one is, how or where did you get your idea and what specific steps did you take to validate it? Um, kind of talked about where the idea came from. Uh, I mean, everyone has a cell phone, and everyone has USB devices. I mean, I think on average, it's about 2.5 devices per individual in the United States. And so that's, that's crazy. And so we knew that there was a, a massive market for it. And so that kind of is, that's not going to be the hard part. You have a market, but the thing is, how many competitors are there? There are a lot of competitors for us. So how are we going to differentiate ourselves? Well, we led off by having a, better, a far better product than the leading competitor, as well as taking the company from a different angle of approach. Uh, instead of being product-centric, like Mophie and all of our competitors are, we're very brand-centric. And so, um, yeah, please. Um, so why don't you think that competitors That's a good question. Um, frankly, I th from our research, uh, you'd be surprised to see how many companies will are trying to copy one another and, tr and instead of focusing on the right aspects of, of the market, which are innovating in the sphere as well as improving technology. And so um, I couldn't tell you exactly why these these companies haven't truly studied their target consumer. However, that's, that's what we did first. Um, and so we sought out to, 
to, to pick a, a group of people that would be using the devices the most and would resonate highly with the type of brand that we wanted to create. And it's, it just happens to be people that are you know, young professionals and including students as well. And so um, that's a tough one, I'm not sure. But uh, I don't know, Will, do you have anything to add? Yeah, it's really not that easy. I mean, honestly, you have to have a background in design as well as engineering. It's the thing about a lot of our competitors' products, um, well, there, there are two main reasons. One is what I just said. And to have a marriage between the two, it's not an easy thing. Because most engineers don't really understand, I mean, to be honest, aesthetics. And most people that know design don't really know how to engineer. So when you have to put two together, they don't always work out. And we, we have happened, we happen, well, we didn't just happen. We put together a good team, and we're able to put that together. But I know that with time, it'll, there will be competitors that will be able to make their slimmer, because they've seen ours, done it. But by then, we'll have a new product. And the second reason is complacency. If you're selling $300 million worth of product, even though it's super thick, who cares? I'd still sell it. I mean, right? I'm, I'm not going to make my team. Yeah, anyway. So. Yeah. Um, Any so other? Yeah, have you guys already taken the product to the international markets, or do you just think you right now? Yes. Yeah, we do. I just actually closed a deal with Denmark yesterday, um, and then also closing a deal with um, one of the largest distributors in England. Um, they're like the equivalent of Best Buy, but over there. And um, there are a few other ones that, and we also sell online through to international. So. Can I say something real quick before you get into it? So I want to bring up an example. Something that seemingly are unrelated, but you'll find it will it'll make sense. I don't know if you guys ever watch Samsung ads. They're awful. I mean, let's be honest. Like, have you seen the one with Galaxy Gear? There he's like snowboarding, and he's trying to pick up on the girl with this thing, like taking pictures. It's like the dumbest thing ever. I mean, don't put, put that part on YouTube. But anyway. Um, <laughs> It's really bad. They are hundreds of, they, the company is worth hundreds of billions. They have a huge budget. Why is their ad so bad? Right? It's the same question. Why do these companies that have millions of dollars not be able to do this? It's not just about the money. It's about the people. It's about having the right team, having the right passion, the right drive. So, Absolutely. Um, so. Yeah, that's uh, honestly having the right team, and even if you're small, having a, a small group of highly talented, highly diverse, and, and a team who is motivated by one cause, who are willing to work together for that, because that's a hard thing to do. To get people to focus and converge on one purpose is extremely hard. And so when you can do that, amazing things can happen, and they can happen in the blink of an eye. And so, I mean, in the blink of an eye to a company like Microsoft or Samsung. And corporate cultures take forever. I mean, for those of you who had experience working, please. Can I actually, I want to make a really quick comment. Oh, um, yeah. And <laughs> some of the benefit of having a small team that's, that's motivated by cause, who are highly talented, skilled, uh, extremely flexible, will, will do anything to win, is that you have a flexibility compared to these, these large corporations that is, is, un, is almost unbeatable. That's one of the biggest strengths of our team at Dark Energy is we're small. We have one person to do pretty much each job in the company, each department. But they do it quickly, fast, and they just execute, execute, execute. And so if you're scared about going up against big companies, yeah, you have, that's, that's true. I mean, they have distribution channels and whatnot if you're a, a hardware product like ours that, that you don't have yet. However, there's a speed and agility that if, you, if, the, if the market is right, that is a sharp sword against you know, your competitors. Sorry, what was the other question that was about to speak? Sorry. Who was it? 
great question. Yeah, so um, so I worked at Cummins prior to coming to uh, meeting, well, working with, uh, dark with, energy. with Will and, on Dark Energy. And Will came from Microsoft. And so we had both saved up a lot of our money. And by the time our prototype was done, our, our money was gone. And, uh, and so we absolutely needed uh, more funding. And that's why we decided to crowdfund it on Kickstarter. And so that's where, uh, that's really the amount of, that's where we got the money to really launch Dark Energy. We did prototyping with our own funds, and I also borrowed, I think, 15K from my, my dad, and we used maybe 10K of it, but honestly, uh, a lot of it came out of our own, our own pockets. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Kickstarter, we raised uh, 173,000. Absolutely not. Um, the, the point is not to be small. The point is to be smarter, faster, um, to work more efficiently. And so uh, the point of having a small team, I mean, the, the point is to be fast. It's not necessarily that you need to have a small team, but then again, um, a small group of, of talented individuals can receive uh, funding very quickly from investors. They like to see a, a small group of people who have big visions for the future, incredible potential, and that they want to believe and buy into. And so um, anyway, that's just a little bit more about investors. But uh, I think we got, how many minutes do we have left? Uh, about a minute and a half. OK. Someone back there had a question, the guy in the blue shirt. I felt bad that you yeah, haven't had a chance to. Yeah. And I know that that can be hard, especially from scratch. Yeah. Especially when you're competing with other already established brands. Certainly. Are there any setbacks in trying to create that positive brand image so that you can work with Will? Uh, did I? Sorry, say the last have part. Any setbacks in creating your brand image that you haven't worked with Will? Well, we spent money on making videos that didn't work out for us. <laughs> um, we've made some. I mean, this is a good one, and this one is professionally done, and we've tried doing it ourselves. Yeah, uh, <laughs> terrible. Um, and <laughs> they cost money, too. Um, but also, we, didn't, we weren't brand experts. I mean, we both came from engineering background. We never did advertising or brand management. But through, um, through our connections, through our friends and family, we've been able to to be able to put together a team that's quite, quite, um, what's the best word? Um, not only effective, but they're really good at what they do. And, and so we, I mean, over time, it's taken us a year to come up with Dark Energy, the brand. And, and we have a lot of new materials that are coming out um, that you'll be seeing in the next few months. But right now, <coughs> we've come to a position that um, we've already experienced those setbacks setbacks and um, we but we were very agile and also um, we didn't really spend a ton of money on those so we had gone through a lot of iterations on our brand and made sure that we improve and got feedback from customers and so finally we came to where we are and you know I think it's we've done it smartly so hope that answered your question yeah, that looks like that's all the time we have. We will be doing a Q&A, uh, I think, directly after this. So uh, please remember your questions, stay, and uh, we can chat more about it. But uh, anyway, thanks for your time. Once again, Garrett Ida, William Lamb of Dark Energy, thank you.